I pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hagwood of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. This is our seven o'clock Bible study hour. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, this evening. And we're going to get into Acts 14 on today. Um, uh, hopefully get through about 19 verses or so uh, through the majority of the chapter, actually, uh, before we end on today. Again, I pray that you're well, First Mount Zion family. I hope that you got all the announcements for today. Got those out a little bit early. And um, and uh, that, again, uh, both for the call posts as well as from uh, the social media page on our Facebook page uh, to know what's going on. Uh, please keep in mind next Friday, uh, uh, Seven Last Words service. I'm getting all those uh, preachers lined up. Uh, I've got five thus far, and uh, I've got two others I need to actually line up. And hopefully, I'll have those locked in uh, by end of day tomorrow. So, uh, thank God for you. Uh, I want to get into this lesson on today, uh, and uh, let's see what God has for us as we uh, have this discussion uh, and talk through it. So, let's have a word of prayer before we get started on today. Let us pray, most eternal and all wise God, our heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you for what you want to do in the midst of this study on this evening. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you bless us and keep us and give us what we need for this journey of life. We love you, Lord, in every way, shape, fashion, and form. Give us what we need, Lord, and we'll be careful to give your name praise, honor, and glory as it is always due. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, as we get into Acts chapter 14, please remember that you know, we ended last week uh, in Acts chapter 13 uh, with regards to uh, Paul and Barnabas um, and their journeys in uh, Perga and Pisidia and Antioch, and um, basically how they basically uh, were preaching and teaching the gospel, telling the story, the narrative, if you will, uh, of uh, the gospel message and leading it all the way up to Christ. And then, of course, uh, there were some individuals, uh, some, uh, they made proclamations as well that they were coming towards the Jews, because, coming towards the Gentile, because many of the Jews had pushed them away uh, in regard to pushed away their message. And so they basically said, you know, we're going to basically wipe the dust off our feet uh, from the perspective of that, which is a similar sign of basically we spread the word and we spread it as accurately as possible. So if you don't receive it, then uh, we're going to wipe the dust off our feet, meaning that there's no harm done to us because we did what God told us to do. And so because of that, um, we now continue this first missionary journey and see the progression of um, Paul and Barnabas as they now come into Iconium, okay? And this is where we begin in Acts chapter 14 on today, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Uh, with the reading of that text. So just keep that in mind. I uh, just wanted to set a little bit of a backdrop before we get into the study, and we're going to get into the word first, and we're going to start kind of breaking this down. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so just give me a second as I take it to the word of God. Even now. There we go. Love that. Just love it. Love it, technology. So with regards to this is where we are. I'm in uh, Bible Way, uh, Bible Way, BibleGateway.com, um, which is on the internet. You can use it. Anyone, it's, it's free uh, in order to look up the word of God. But we always teach from the international, new international version, God's word. And this is what, what it says in Acts chapter 14, as we go to our text today. It says, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. And there was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Laconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country. 
where they continued to preach the gospel. Verse eight, in Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth, <clears throat> excuse me, and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes uh, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reeves to, to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word, and may it truly sanctify us to the deepest roots of our heart. Let's go back to verse one. So what we see here now is at Iconium, okay, um, Paul and Barnabas went to um, the Jewish synagogue, okay, and they spoke um, to a great number of both Jews and Greeks, meaning Jews and Gentiles alike. And, and uh, many believe, both Jews and, 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 uh, and Greeks. But verse two says, but the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brother, brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Now, why is this important from the standpoint of our faith, okay, and, and even historically? The reason is because what we are seeing again is this is, you know, the, 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 the noise, if you will, okay? This is jargon and, um, and those speaking against the word of God in the context of what Paul and Barnabas are attempting to do. So as more people are believing, okay, Jews and Gentiles alike, there, there were Jews in the synagogue, they didn't believe, and they're trying to now infiltrate the minds of many of the Gentiles that are there, poison their minds to not believing what Paul and Barnabas are preaching and what they're teaching. So Paul and Barnabas now have to spend more time in this area in order to combat the contrary spirits and contrary uh, language and jargon that's going on, okay? So, so they can show that, that what they're teaching is right, it's correct, and it's truly of God through Jesus Christ. Not only that, it says in order to confirm their message, there were many signs and wonders, meaning miracles, that they began to perform, they were performing in order to justify the message that they, they had been preaching. Now, this is not to say that they said, well, we're going to start performing signs and wonders so they believe. 
No, God enabled them to perform these signs and wonders so that the people would believe the message. Because some people, sometimes people aren't convinced of the message that's conveyed unless they have quote unquote proof. And with that, the signs and wonders were coming um, that, that God allowed Paul and Barnabas to, you know, to execute so that people would believe. And they wouldn't believe the naysayers, if you will, and the kind of language that was going on amongst some of the Jews trying to poison the minds of many of the Greeks and even Jews uh, that were in the synagogue listening to Paul and Barnabas. And, and I think for the today's church, this is something that we have to keep in mind um, um, very acutely, to be honest with you, because what we teach and what we preach um, ha has significant value for everyone, but at the same time, you're going to have individuals that are going to try to speak against it. So this is why it is so important that we make sure that we are truly doing what the Bible tells us to do, truly to study and show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, because we need to be able to do that, Okay. Um, you know, reading the Bible, understanding the word, getting significant training in, in, in biblical thought and things of that nature. And forgive me for the phone ringing, but um, um, doing those things actually allows, allows and helps um, with regards to the teaching and the preaching and exposition of word. And what it begins to do, it allows for that space, um, uh, allows, allows for a more um, trustful space um, in a very an integrity lay space to project the gospel. Okay, because there are going to be many, you know, or at least some that are going to try to come against the word of God with falsehoods, facades, lies, and whatever else. Okay, that's completely against the word of God. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, the early church dealt with it. We're seeing that here, and we even deal with it now. Okay. So um, you truly have to stand on firm ground. And this is why I'm just, I'm a proponent personally, um, especially for leaders in the church, specifically preachers um, and pastors, that if you're called to this, you need to be trained. You need to get some training. You, you need to be learning continuously because there are so many different and difficult circumstances and occurrences that are going to happen in the midst of ministry. And if you don't know how to address it, I'm not saying that everything's going to have an answer, but if you don't know how to address it, you could easily be tarnishing uh, the witness of Christ um, because of how you handle the word of God when trying to relay it, display it, teach it and preach it to other people. And I think this is why it's so important that again, you learn all that you can um, in regards to the word of God uh, and ministry and theology and those all those pieces, ministry in and of itself, so that we can truly rightly divide the word of truth and lead people down Christ's path, not down a contrary path, and not be able and, and not and not um, have a, enough um, wherewithal as well as uh, biblical acumen to be able to show someone and tell someone, okay, that's not the way of Christ, and this is why. Okay, okay, it's not to to, to bash someone, you know, in the head basically. Um, or to have an argument or, or be in a quarrel. But all it says is, how can you handle the word of God in order to make sure people understand what's God's way and what's not, okay? And I think this is something that we have to keep in mind when we are um, displaying the word of God in various, various forms, okay? Um, verse four says, the people of the city were divided. See what happens? It causes separation. When you have this kind of confusion and messy uh, mess that goes on in the church and all this confusion and chaos, tohu, that's the Hebrew word for chaos. Um, when you see all that going on, um, it causes confusion. And what it does, it doesn't unite, it divides, it separates. And it says some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles, okay? And when we say apostles here, it's kind of the, 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 the missionary meaning of apostles, meaning those who have been sent out uh, doing the work of Christ, missionary work, okay? And that's what Paul and Barnabas are doing. Then verse five says, there was a plot 
afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them, meaning Paul and Barnabas, and to stone them. See, I, I, I must stop here for a second because what we have here is not only the mistreatment with regards to the word of God, but often, now I'm not going to say oftentimes, but it does happen uh, sometimes that that disagreement or, or, or those people who are trying to teach a contrary word that's contrary to the word of God sometimes can become violent, okay? And this is why we have to be very careful in regards to the preaching and teaching of the word because there is a lot of cost and sacrifice and persecution that's tied to it. And I, and I say this in, perspective, in, in, uh, in respect to the early church, but I also say it because if you are a, if you're proselytizing, the word of God, all that means is that you're evangelizing the word of God. You're going to and fro and teaching about the goodness of God and helping to get folks saved by Christ's salvation. In certain parts of the world, you can easily be harmed and violence can come at you. And their people have been killed for their stand, uh, their stand in being a Christian and being one who's on Christ's side. Um. I know you heard me talk about um, uh, folks who have been on missionary journeys and um, have either been hurt severely uh, or been killed, possibly, uh, because of their belief and what they believe God had called them to in the midst of doing the work of Christ and saving souls and going to various places around the world in order to teach and preach the word of God. The word of God can cost you your life, your physical life, in some places, even in the United States. And this is why I say what I say, because um, this is not something to be taken lightly, uh, because suffering and persecution comes in many different forms. And we see it uh, a lot, okay, in, in various ways. We see it. And uh, in cer certain places outside of this country, Again, you could just as well be killed. You could just as well give up your life, your physical life, because of what you stand for and your belief in Jesus Christ, okay? And we see here in the text that the church is facing uh, persecution. That verse five really gets me. It says that they plotted, meaning the Gentiles and Jews together with those other leaders who were in disagreement with Paul and Barnabas, they plotted to mistreat them, and they tried to stone them, okay? Now, this is key because stoning in Jewish culture is was equivalent, that was the penalty for quote-unquote blasphemy, okay? that that So if, if you blasphemed, at least in their eyes, if you blasphemed the word of God, meaning say, meaning and saying that, um, that, that what you were preaching and teaching is not what God has said, at least that's what they believed. So the penalty for that was that you're an open uh, blasphemist, if you will, and you need to be stoned, okay? <clears throat> we see this, of course, in Jesus' ministry with the woman <clears throat> who's caught in the act of adultery, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> who's caught in the act of adultery. And they pull her out in the open and they start grabbing rocks. And they're ready to kill her, okay? Until Jesus basically says what he says and says that those without sin cast the first stone. And everyone starts dropping their rocks because they know if they killed her, then they themselves need to be killed for their own sin as well. And they didn't want to eat that penalty. So they said, what's the point? And they dropped the stones and walked away, okay? So we see now <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas are now going through persecution for what they're preaching and teaching. But look how it all got set up. It was set up through a plot, a scheme, uh, being able to 
strategize, if you will, assault on Paul and Barnabas for what they were teaching and preaching. This is something, again, that you see consistently amongst or against the church. It is individuals who come up against the church for whatever reason um, in order to promote some level of violence towards the, towards the church. And again, persecution comes in many different forms. And what I'm saying here, as far as the lesson is concerned, is we must be careful because even this good word, this good news that we preach and teach every week, there are folks who don't consider it good and they consider it evil, even, if, even when it's good. And they would just as well harm someone. They would just as well promote violence or provoke violence against someone because of this good news. It's amazing what the name of Jesus will do. Okay, It's amazing what the name of Jesus will do. It will save, save some, but also it'll make others go crazy and try to nullify the name of Christ because they disagree with it. And why do they disagree with it? Because the word of Christ shows love by way of conviction. You're convicted of your wrongdoings, convicted of your sins, not to the point of being condemned, but to the point that you recognize them. And Christ says, I recognize them too. I can save you if you would only believe in me, in my salvation, through the cross and through the empty tomb of the resurrection. Hope this helps the early church to help you understand these pieces and parts. There's a lot here. I'm going to keep going. There's a lot more to talk about. Verse number six. It says, but they had, they found out about it and fled to Lyconian to the Iconian cities of Lystra and Derby, and to the surrounding country where they continue to preach the gospel. Folks, they had to go on the run. Paul and Barnabas, they had to get out of Dodge. They had to get out of Iconia because the threat of their lives, okay? They could have just as well been killed. And they were like, they're coming for us. And if we stay, we could just as well be killed. They're promoting violence. They're trying to throw stones and kill us. So they ended up leaving. And now they're headed to now Lystra and Derby, okay? Um, and to the surrounding country. And let me help you geographically see this uh, on today as I'm sharing my screen. Uh, and hopefully it'll switch over appropriately as I, um, yeah, there we go. So what you see is, um, this is the map we've been watching and looking at. And here is a left, this is where they left. Uh, voting, you see here is Paul and Barnabas flee to avoid being killed. Okay, that's what we just read. And so here's Iconium, and now they're going down to Lystra. Okay. Um, going down to Lystra, and they're going to end up going to Derby. Okay, and they're going to flip back and go to Derby as well. So these are two towns in our next coming scriptures that they're going to be in, okay? So I wanted to show that to you so that you can kind of see geographically kind of what's going on and um, the, the travels of that first missionary journey. Okay. So let's go down to verse eight. It says, in Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul and was uh, as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Another miracle, okay? Another aspect of proof that what they're preaching and teaching about this dirt poor carpet in the ghettos of Nazareth named Jesus the Christ, who's been raised from the dead after being crucified, that that power is real. Okay, that it can heal and deliver. So because of that, now this man in Lystra receives a miracle. 
hears the word of God, believes it, believes he can be healed, and is healed. Okay? Stands up on his feet. He was lame, but now he's jumping up and he's walking. Very similar to Acts chapter 3. Okay? At that gate called Beautiful, when Peter met that lame man that was sitting at the gate uh, begging for alms. Okay? We see the power of God still moving in the midst of ministry, regardless of the persecution. And remember, they're in Lystra because they're running away from Iconium because of the threat of being killed, of being stoned to death. Again, keep this in mind, okay? Uh, verse 11. It says, when the crowd saw, it, saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language. The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reeds to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Now, the problem that we have here is um, this, this uh, ask of Greek mythology. Okay, in the uh, King James version, you'll see the names. Uh, I think is mentioned as Jupiter and Merimus. Okay, Jupiter means Zeus. That's what that that's what it means. You see it in the King James version. Merimus means um, the other name that uh, yeah Hermes. Okay, but these we know are Greek gods. Okay, I put that in quotes. Small g, Greek gods. So when this when when this miracle happen, the folks in Lystra begin to associate the miracle and Paul and Barnabas themselves as the human reincarnation, if you will, of Zeus and uh, Hermes. And so even to the point that they had a priest who now want to offer sacrifices um, to them, to them, um, to them, because they're now looking at them as Greek gods. And so it's amazing how folks can easily associate the things of God, what God has done, what God does in miracles, and associate them with nothing that has power, with mythology if you will. And it's a very warped belief. And I think that's this is a very dangerous thought, if you will. I think when you really, really think about it, because um, the association of, of miracles and the power where, where they come from, that misassociation can have people following the wrong thing, okay? Uh, the wrong ideology. Wrong, um, wrong faith uh, from that perspective. And I think this is where this kind of comes in from that perspective. And you see Paul and Barnabas actually stop it uh, when we get to verse 14. It says, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. And I want to deal with this in a second. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. Uh, he gives, he provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Now, this is where I think for me, um, let me read verse 18. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. What Paul and Barnabas are really trying to do they're trying to express the reality of what has been experienced to these individuals who are worshiping Greek gods. 
He says, first of all, both of them, um, we're only human like you. We're not gods, okay? Let's tell you about the true and living God who made the heavens and the earth, who made the sea and everything in them. And with this, when we get to verse 17, he says, yet he has not left himself without testimony. And this is key here. Why is this important? Testimony is important because what we are left with now are the stories, the narrative, the word of God that points in various ways, in various forms, the reality of Christ, the reality that he is the son of God, and that with that, the crucifixion and resurrection bring us into a new reality of acceptance of his salvation and also the preeminence of who God is in the context of our world. And by doing that, what they're doing is, is they're one, suppressing themselves, removing themselves out of the equation because they're only vessels, and making sure that they are pointing back towards God. And they're making it clear that, look, this thing doesn't come without a storyline. This, these occurrences and what you're seeing in the healing and, and, and those being transformed and renewed, uh, this doesn't come by way of accident. We have thousands of years of documentation that we point back to, and we know that it is God, our God, through Jesus Christ that has done it. And that's why, church, for anyone who is a believer of Jesus Christ, who is saved by the bloodstained banner of Christ, you, my brother, you, my sister, you, my friend, have a testimony. And you have a salvation testimony, one, but also you have a series of testimonies that point directly back to Christ, healings, folks in your family getting saved, miracles that you know happen, financial miracles, miracles for your body of healing, um, resurrection stories, someone who may have had a very ill and bad spirit that caused them to be incarcerated in prison, but now they're released and found Christ, received the salvation, and their whole life has been turn 180 degrees. Those are the consistent testimony, even in death, death of loved ones, death of loved ones, how God kept them in life, how God kept them, kept them and has provided a home for them because they had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. They believe in Christ, how Christ has kept them in the difficulty of losing someone. Testimony after testimony, after testimony. And this becomes the residual of our walk and our journey. Because as long as you live, you're going to continue to see God operate and walk and move and, 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 and do things and perform activities in your life that you know, if it had not been for the Lord, and you will always think about it because it will always be a something in a track of your remembrance in your mind of what God has done for you. And that is the testimony of those who are in Christ's church. This becomes fuel, if you will. And that's why I love that verse. It says, yet he, meaning Christ, has not left himself without testimony. Now look at the rest of it. He has shown kindness. Oh, that's a testimony. By giving you rain from heaven and crops in season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. More testimony, testimony after testimony after testimony. And after you don't got so much testimony, you, you've gotten to a point where you've encouraged yourself because of the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and how God has continued to give and provide in various ways. 
And it's that testimony that folk need to hear. Not necessarily everything that the pastor preaches, but you have your own story. You know, you have your own narrative of what God has done for you. And I guarantee you what he's done for you definitely ties back into the word of God. What he's done. Something is to talk about. Because I believe that even in our places where we are half full, or even almost empty, that's the testimony is part of how God fills our cup back and gives us that much more strength to keep on moving, to keep on going, to keep on waving our hands and say, thank you, God, for all that you have done. Hallelujah. And so Paul and Barnabas want to correct the language. They want to get the language right, at least in this instance, so that they, these people will know about Christ and prayerfully accept his salvation. Wow. Wow. Powerful stuff, y'all. Verse 18 says, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Because unfortunately, some people are so stuck, stuck on a certain way of thinking that they can't hear what you have to say. So just warped and this is the consistent fight, I believe, that we all, especially as ministers of the gospel, have. But at the same time, we, we don't really, we're not supposed to fight in it, okay? And, and what I mean is, we're only vessels to, 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 to project the testimony of the gospel, of the good news of Christ. Once we do that, it's the atmosphere. Now, we can help people and guide them and prayerfully lead them to Christ, but it still becomes the ultimate choice for those who are listening to that message. They have to make that choice. Pastor can't make the choice for another individual. That individual has to make the choice after what God has given through the pastor has been spoken and said by way of the testimony of Christ, by way of the personal testimony, which is also hinged to Christ, and the various testimony of the church, what, of what God continues to, do, uh, continues to do and what he has done historically. Okay? Uh, there's a lot that's there, and I believe that when we do that, uh, prayerfully, you just pray and hope that folks will grab onto that message and say, you know what? What must I do to be saved? I need Christ's salvation because I don't have it. And for those who have strayed away from it, it powers them and it gives them newness of life where they can reestablish themselves. Um, not really reestablish themselves, but God reestablished them to do his work, okay? And not just do his work. Doing, people think that it's just doing work in the church. Well, no, it's not just that. It's 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 a it's a newness of life. Uh, how you how you're living, how you're journeying through life, okay? Because that's what brings about what salvation does transforms us, transmogrifies us, and with that transformation becomes newness. Okay, old things have passed away. We're new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become what new. They become new. So we must keep this in mind. Okay. Uh, I'm only going to take a few more minutes. Um, I want to get into verses 19 and 20. That's where we're going to end tonight. Uh, on tonight. Give me a second here. And then it says, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. Okay? See, those, those same folks that were trying to cause havoc and trouble, they're still causing havoc and trouble. And they came, um, the, some Jews came from Antioch, meaning Antioch is not in Syria, but, but uh, Pisidian Antioch, that's what they're talking about, and Iconium. So they followed them to Lystra, okay, and to Derby. And once some of the crowd over, then it says they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. See what they did to, see what they did to Paul? Now remember, let's, let's remember again who Paul is. Paul was formerly Saul of Tarsus, who was the coat check guy 
at the stoning of Stephen before Saul of Tarsus, meaning Paul, his conversion in Acts chapter 9. Now, Paul has been stoned. Now, what should that tell you? Sometimes spirits are only with you because you're with them. And as soon as you go against what that spirit is about, what that spirit's connotation is spiritually and what um, it thrusts itself to, once you're in disagreement with that by the way of your journey in life and, and conversion over to Christ, once that happens, that spirit will attack you. It will. Because now you're not part of them anymore. You're not part of uh, that group anymore. You're part of them. And now since you're a part of them, well, we're against them. And they began to stone Paul. And they drug him out in the street and thought he was dead. Whoo. <sighs> I want to say this, when you give your life over to Christ, man, sometimes you don't realize in the freedom that you just received that there are, there are devils and demons waiting to throw rocks at you and to promote violence against you and to persecute you in some way or form. It is amazing to me, and I, 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 I'm one of the biggest proponents that will say, once you accept Christ, what you have done is you put a bullseye on your chest. You've done that. Because the enemy doesn't like it. The spirit of the world doesn't like it. The evil spirit of the world doesn't like it. And they're coming for you. Because of that transformational, transitional change over to the good news of Christ through his salvation and the new life which you're now exhibiting. You have to get ready for the onslaught because it's going to come and it's part of the journey. But when you're made as a new creature, expect it. But also don't respond as the world would or as those who are trying to persecute you, persecute you the way that they're coming at you. Don't come at them in that same manner. Okay. This is then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and one crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city and thinking he was dead. Verse 20, though. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They thought they had killed Paul. And the thing is, that's, 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 the motiv that's the motivation of anyone who is trying to kill or slay a the, the, the good message of good news of Christ. They will attempt to do it, trying to hush up, trying to hush the messenger, knowing, not knowing, or not understanding that the message comes from God, and God can use anyone to project that message, not just one vessel. And it seems as though everyone is trying to attack vessels because they can't attack God. Well, they're attacking God when they're attacking God's vessel. But attacking the vessel is only one piece because the message, that true and righteous message, it's still going to permeate. It's still going to move out. It's still going to go forward. And that's something that a lot of folks, I think, don't really get or understand. And so with this, the disciples, at, uh, but after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city, went back into Lystra. But the next day, he and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, they left. They left. Again, violence. 
for teaching and preaching the good news of Christ. Ah, as the late Representative John Lewis said, trying to do good, trying to do the good things of God, to do the righteous and justice, do the righteousness and justice of God will oftentimes get you in good trouble. And unfortunately, uh, you may experience extreme persecution because of it. And that's part of this walk. And that's one of the things I think this lesson teaches us is that we, we, we're going to always, the church will always face persecution. It always will. But we cannot respond in a way, the same way that the world uh, has responded to us violently. We have to still respond with that transformational being, character, and message of Christ that's embodied in our spirit. And that's what projects out. Not malice, not envy, not hatred, and definitely not violence. Hmm. I'm done with this lesson on today. Uh, I pray God uh, that, that you enjoyed it. On today, next week, uh, we will uh, dive into the remainder of this chapter and uh, actually finish it off. We may move right into 15 as well. We'll see where it goes um, as God leads us. But I pray that you're enjoying uh, the study in the book of Acts. Um, I mean, God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Let's have a word of prayer as we uh, dismiss on today. Let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for still understanding, oh Lord, that persecution will come with this walk, but you are faithful and just, oh God, not only to forgive us our sins, but also, Lord, to keep us whole during the midst of those moments of persecution that we go through. As your word tells us, oh Lord, as you gave it to Paul, the trouble on every side but not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're never destroyed. We love you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us now, keep us, give us what we need on this journey, and we'll be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I am Pastor Hagwood of uh, the First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed.